OK, all right. Welcome, everyone, to the final session, uh, final talk, I should say, of the of the workshop. We still have the discussion later tonight. Uh, and just to remind everyone before we get into the talk, that will be on Zoom. And you should have the email for that um, sent to you, but I will post it in the chat here in any case. Um, and uh, right, OK, so, so let's get into the session. So we have uh, Julian uh, Goetz from um, Heidelberg and uh, Bern, and uh, he's going to talk to us about some uh, really cool uh, neuromorphic hardware stuff, I think. Brilliant. Um, Julian, take yes. it away. Thanks, everyone. Oh, I can hear my again again. This is weird. I just, sorry. This uh, it's the also, yeah, you sound fine here. OK. Can you mute yourself, maybe? OK, yeah. This is, OK, thanks. OK, sorry. Um, thanks, everyone, for this very cool workshop. I'm sorry, this is so, This why is this happening now again? I can Do you have another window open by any chance? I tried not to. Oh, sorry. I'm so <clears throat> nervousness. Um, thanks for this cool workshop. It's so been good. a pleasure to participate, and I really welcome uh, the chance to present my results here. Um, adding to all the technical problems now, I'm also really nervous, and I apologize in advance for this. Uh, but now let's get, get right into this. At this workshop, we've heard a few talks already about uh, how to use spiking neural networks as universal function approximators. And the approach I'm going to present fits right into this. Uh, we propose uh, efficient and exact error backpropagation based, based learning on spike times of leaky integrated fire neurons. Our approach for training needs only spike times as observables and is also really robust uh, with regards to irregularities in the sub substrate. This, uh, together with only needing spike times, uh, makes it very suitable for neomorphic hardware. And I will show uh, one highly energy efficient implementation on neomorphic hardware. Um, I will skim only over the introduction because most of the things have already been said. We've already heard yesterday um, by Sander and uh, Julia and also Emre um, how different uh, spiking neural networks behave, or from basically from everyone, uh, how different spiking neural networks behave compared to classical computers and ANNs. Uh, and that still there's a huge trend for using spiking neural networks to uh, employ their speed and energy efficiency, and that we want to take up ideas from nature uh, to make use of uh, how nature pr pro uh, processes uh, the uh, speed with speed and energy efficiency. Uh, we've also uh, heard about the biological possibility of uh, different codings, and that there's especially, in particular, uh, some time to first spike coding in different uh, areas, for example, in the fingertips. Uh, Emre yesterday also talked about uh, different neuromorphic hardware systems and how we want to use uh, them with spiking neural networks. Uh, I want to highlight uh, two more points. Uh, one was a bit uh, uh, pointed out today by uh, um, Claudia about uh, studying perturbations. Um, also in the discussion yesterday, uh, I unfortunately forget, forgot your name, uh, but uh, someone uh, told about her use of Spinnaker and the difference to the neural sim simulator and how the neural simulators so the few simulations uh, produced more accurate results uh, than the neuromorphic digital neuromorphic hardware uh, Spinnaker. And this difference in accuracy is a detail uh, that we should not brush under the carpet. This is a very uh, fundamental thing. Uh, we should uh, try to find algorithms that are not uh, disturbed by having well some disturbances. and um, any algorithm that aims for uh, neuromorphic hardware uh, compatibility or um, even biological plausibility, I mean, biology is not a perfect substrate as well, uh, should prove uh, robustness towards um, inaccuracies. And also yesterday, uh, to the answer of a question to Sander uh, about why we bother the, with the difficulties of spiking neural networks, he answered uh, that we want to do it uh, in, because we want to uh, use the speed and the energy efficiency uh, of neuromorphic hardwares and the combination to, of spiking neural networks in theory. And I hope that my talk uh, could prove uh, one, one fundamental point uh, for him to in, in, in the future not use in theory, because it will provide an actual implementation, actual results from an implementation and uh, show the energy efficiency of this. I will start uh, by describing the uh, system on which we did this. This is the brain skills two system, a neuromorphic hardware system developed in Heidelberg, then describe the approach we're using, 
show some simulation results and then the hardware implementation. So uh, let's start with the uh, neomorphic hardware. Brain Skills 2 is a mixed signal neomorphic hardware. Uh, this means that uh, it uses digital spikes for communication to make full use of the sparseness of uh, digital uh, communication. Uh, but the, the analog, uh, the neurons are analog. Uh, this means that uh, biological observables, like for example the membrane voltage, are represented by actual physical quantities. And on the right you see an image of an oscillograph that records one such voltage of one neuron on this chip. Uh, this physical emulation uh, has a few follow-ups. One is that all the neurons are independently and asynchronously emulated. This means uh, that no matter how many uh, neurons you use on a chip, uh, the runtime on this chip stays the same. So using twice the neurons uh, will not produce uh, longer experiments. Another uh, thing is that uh, to, to emulate those physical quantities on the chip, um, we use tiny resistors and tiny capacitances. Uh, and those two things are um, what determines uh, the, the time scales on which the neurons operate on. And on the chip we're using, uh, these are typically in the range of uh, microseconds. Comparing this with uh, the typical uh, time scales in biology, which are on the range of microseconds, uh, milliseconds, sorry, um, we get a speed up of uh, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4. This means that uh, we can emulate that one second of biological um, dynamics in just uh, below one milliseconds. Unfortunately, uh, the analog nature, while having uh, many uh, uh, advantages, there's also some disadvantages. And the major one is uh, that the neurons do not behave as uh, exactly in simulation. There are some variations in between, uh, between neurons. And um, yes, here you see uh, a schematic of the chip. Um, the large shiny surfaces in the, in the image on the left are the synapse arrays. Those are uh, where spikes are rooted to the neurons. And you uh, can also, uh, the neurons on this chip are located in between those large shiny, surf shiny surfaces. Uh, this chip has a total of 512 neurons and synapses uh, of uh, 256 times 512 uh, well, synapses. Uh, our setup that we use on this chip uh, is for a uh, layered network. You can uh, emulate arbitrary networks in theory, but the setup we are using is uh, 256 uh, inputs uh, up to, to up to 128 hidden uh, neurons to up to 100, 128 label neurons with uh, fully connection. And this determines uh, the experiment sizes we're using. Um, there's also different units on this chip. For example, the PPU, which means plasticity, uh, processing unit, uh, which is a general processor, a general purpose processor, which can be used uh, for other experiments and to change uh, synapse connection at runtime. And uh, all those units um, and uh, the configurability of this chip makes it a very re uh, versatile research tool. And I'll try to highlight this um, versatility now um, by showing some experiments. This is an experiment by Corbini and Schreiber uh, where well, in the spirit of doing uh, neuro research, uh, he put a whole network on this chip. And the network he put on the chip um, was uh, a network that is part of an insect brain that, wants, that has the uh, uh, goal of navigating an insect. This insect is uh, cruising its surroundings and then has to um, return in a mostly direct way to its hive. And um, this experiment can be run fully on this chip. Then another experiment, this uh, one is by uh, Sebastian Biludel and uh, Benjamin Kramer. Um, we're all talking about uh, synapse uh, plasticity, so changing weights of synapses. Uh, what they are doing in this experiment goes further. They're not only changing weights of existing synapses, but they're using this PPU, this uh, plasticity processing unit, to uh, adapt to create and destroy synapses uh, on this chip at runtime. So this experiment is again fully on chip, chip uh, on on chip, and uh, this structural plasticity, so creating and uh, destroying synapses based on the network's needs, allows learning of receptor fields. Uh, this allows uh, experimenters to overcome the uh, limitations for connections on the hardware. Then there's also classification tasks. Uh, one very recent uh, work by Benjamin Kram and Sebastian Kipilodel, again, uh, together with Friedem and Senke to put uh, surrogate gradient uh, methods on this chip. Uh, this is some, in some way uh, similar to what we are doing, because, well, it's classification, but it's also in some aspects very different. So um, 
they're using in surrogate gradient um, voltages. Um, yes, and uh, on the right you see uh, some plot of uh, our result, and uh, this will be shown uh, later again. And the voltages here are just for um, to to illustrate uh, what the network is doing. We do, we're not using we're not using uh, voltages. Um, we are just spike based. We only need spikes to learn. And we have an exact model as opposed to the surrogate gradient method. So um, what is our um, method? We want to learn with leaky integrated and fire uh, spike times, spike times of leaky integrated and fire neurons. And it turns out it's really hard. And I'll illustrate why. So we've heard already uh, sometime um, on, on, how, on this dif these difficulties. Uh, on the left, you see the postsynaptic potentials of um, leaky integrated and fire neurons uh, for different uh, membrane time con uh, combinations constant combinations. Uh, the gray one is a non-leaky integrated and fire neuron where the membrane time constant uh, is infinity. And you see that for all the other ones, the actual leaky integrated and fire neurons, uh, the PSP is non-monotonic. And this monotonicity of the PSP uh, is what uh, creates the basic problems. Um, I'll highlight two of these problems. In the center column, you see uh, discontinu discontinuity introduced by, this, uh, by these PSPs. Uh, you see the membrane voltage of a neuron that receives input uh, by input spikes. Those are the uh, upward arrows below. And uh, if there's an output spike, you see it on, on the top as a downward arrow. And you see that in the top panel, the um, PSP overlap is not uh, significant enough and there's no spike elicited. But if the spikes are moved closer together, suddenly the membrane is enough uh, to reach a threshold and a spike is elicited. So the spike just appears. This is the discontinuity introduced by uh, the non-monotonicity of the um, postsynaptic potentials. On the right, uh, you see non-monotonicity of the spike uh, timing as well. Uh, and this is shown again in the setup where we have two input spikes. Uh, one, the second input spike, the uh, black arrow, uh, stays at the same time uh, every t all the time. And then we show uh, in the first, in the beginning, just one second, uh, first input spike. This is the blue one. And you see, uh, again, there's an overlap of the PSPs, and we produce an output spike at some time. This is the blue arrow on top. Now, if we uh, move the blue arrow, input arrow, to later times, um, like this, then we see that the spike time that uh, comes out of this is earlier than, than before. So moving the spike time, the input spike time, uh, to a later time produces an earlier res uh, resulting spike time. Now, if you go even further and uh, press uh, and, and move the spike even further back, then the spike time, the output spike time decreases again. So one action of moving the input spike time to later times uh, produced different results on uh, what the current scenario was. And uh, this is, well, non-monotonicity in, in spike times. Mm, we can also formulate this um, problem in uh, equations. And uh, unlike Claudia, I will have two slides uh, with uh, equations on them, but there's just one, so that this doesn't count. Um, so mathematically, we want to describe the spike time. Um, and this is the time where the membrane uh, reaches the threshold. Uh, this is essentially this equation. And you see that the output spike time, the capital T, um, occurs in two uh, places, in two exponents with different coefficients. And uh, this makes it very hard to solve the problem in general. One possibility uh, where it's solvable uh, is when we have a non-leaky integrated and fire spike time. So when the uh, membrane time constant approaches infinity, then the first term just becomes one, and we can solve this um, for the output spike time. This was done by uh, Hesha Mustafa in 2017. But there's also possibilities where we can solve this. Um, these are two equations, uh, those on the left, uh, that I found uh, during my master thesis, which I started two years ago and uh, finished last year. Um, the first uh, equation that we can solve is if the spike time, uh, the time constants, tau m and tau s, are exactly equal. Then we don't have a um, PSP shape of different of difference of exponentials, but uh, an alpha shape. And this can be solved, the resulting equation, with the lambda w function. There's another possibility if there's a factor of two between the two time constants. And this includes uh, the other way around, because the um, PSP is symmetric in the two time constants. Then this equation becomes essentially a quadratic equation, which you can again solve. And those two equations that you see here are for differentiable uh, with respect to ti and double wi. Um, uh, I'll focus now on the first case, so with uh, the ratio of the two time constants being exactly one. 
And I wrote down the derivatives so that you believe me that they're differ differentiable. And uh, those two equations are remarkable because the first one, uh, we remember we, we haven't done any approximations now. Uh, and the first one, this uh, derivative of, of the output spike time with respect to uh, WI, this is uh, synaptic plasticity. This is what we want when we want to optimize input weights uh, to optimize the spike time to do something. Um, and the second equation, so the derivative with respect to the incoming spike times, this allows us to do uh, error backpropagation. Um, with these two equations, we can exactly solve the credit assignment problem and optimize functions on spike times uh, however we like. Uh, in, uh, in particular, this allows us to do error backpropagation in networks of leak integrated and fire neurons. And I'll turn on the uh, setup that we're using. So we're using hierarchical networks of leaky integrated fire neurons. Uh, on the left, you see a schematical overview. Uh, so the inputs are the squares. Then we have a hidden label, a hidden layer in uh, circles, and the output layer as uh, triangles. And uh, for input encoding, we use uh, time to free spike coding. This means that stronger features, represented as darker pixels here, um, uh, are translated to earlier spike times. And you see this in the right, there's a schematic raster plot um, that features the symbols on the of the left side. Uh, you see that the dark squares are, are earlier spikes than the, for example, gray or white ones. And for decoding, we also use um, time to free spike coding. This means that the neuron that spikes first determines the class of the pattern that the network is looking at. And this is allows us to do a, um, and, and loss function uh, to, to describe a loss function that is not uh, based on any well, uh, onset that, that is just based on the time differences of the uh, output spike times of the label spike times and uh, what our goal in training is to increase the difference between the wrong spikes and the correct spike how does this turn out in practice uh, here is the uh, the training mechanism illustrated by voltages and um, you see before training and after training let's just focus on the uh, um, it's three samples so let's focus on the bottom row uh, here you see that after training which is uh, we initialize uh, randomly uh, the spike times are basically indistinguishable but after training uh, the spike time of the blue neuron which, which you can see as uh, where the reset happens uh, happens uh, very early in the spike, and it's uh, way before the where the blue, the green, and the red uh, neurons spike. And you can also see that uh, during training, uh, this network was trained to inhibit those second neurons, the wrong neurons, to spike only later. How do we cut from left to right, to, from before training to after training? Here I show this process. Uh, so on the x-axis you now have epochs, and on this uh, y-axis uh, you can see the spike time. Again, the lowest panel, the blue class, we can see that um, the blue spike time, so the correct spike time, is decreased uh, at er early in the training and the others are pushed back. Um, this means that the network learns to classify this sample correctly and uh, to have this uh, large input uh, separation of the label spike times. Um, this is just for free samples, but how does this turn out for all the training samples? Well, here is a, a histogram plot over all training samples and the spike time of the correct label neurons, this is shown in orange, um, is at the beginning, so before training, uh, basically again, indistinguishable from the spike times of the wrong label neurons. But after training, so the right plot, you see that there's a big difference introduced. Um, now I can show you the actual simulation results. Uh, usually people, uh, when showing the, how their algorithms work, will uh, show their show MNIST as an example, and I will do this in a second. But I want to start with a different data set. Um, this is because uh, in MNIST, the difference of what a linear classifier can achieve uh, is actually not that far from what a deep network can achieve. And we've designed a special data set, uh, the Ying Yang data set, that you can find on my collaborator's Clara Kines uh, GitHub account. The link is down there. Um, where this gap between linear classifier and deep network is uh, a lot uh, larger. This is also, so this uh, data set uh, is called the Yang data set, and it consists of samples that uh, are defined as an X and a Y coordinate. So you see those points there and uh, the associated class. So whether they lie in the yin, the yang, or the dot part of the symbol. And um, Yes, this is a low dimensional uh, data set, which is uh, still uh, rather hard to train. 
because the points in this data set can lie arbitrarily close to each other. And the network has to uh, have hard decision boundaries <coughs> sorry, uh, on uh, what class it associates the um, patterns to. Uh, and actually, where the dot are, uh, dots are, are, there are many, many uh, points close to the borders. So this is a real uh, hard uh, task for this uh, data set. Uh, and now I show uh, how we come from this spatial representation to the temporal representation that we give to the networks. For this, I grab, grab three um, patterns, three, three samples, red, green, and blue. And um, you see that, uh, for example, for the red one, you see the small uh, x coordinate is translated to an early x spike. So on the right, there's a schematic raster plot as well. Uh, again, and uh, the large y coordinate is translated to a later y spike. Now, uh, red, green, and blue, you might be catching on. Funnily enough, you've seen what the network does with this before. This the, uh, training mechanism I showed was from exactly these samples, and we saw that the network is training those correctly. Um, the classification happens based on the spike time. So we're looking at the spike times of the uh, three different neurons again. Let's look at the left one, the yin neuron. So after training, this is uh, what the neuron, uh, what the output spike times of this yin neuron are. Yeah, yes, for the different samples in, again, the spatial representation. And uh, to make it clear when a spike has been the first spike, um, we subtract the first spike time in the label layer from this to all, uh, so that all classifying spikes uh, are shown as a bright yellow color. And you can see that uh, for the senior, uh, the, the area of the bright yellow, so the first classification, uh, aligns very well with uh, the area of this class. And you can see also that on the border or close to the border, the spike times changes abruptly. So here, uh, uh, stark nonlinearity is introduced by the network to be able to distinguish between the different samples. These spike times determine the classification. And uh, here on the right, we see the classification um, directly. So the dots have the color of the uh, what class the network thinks the pattern has. And if it, uh, the network def decided uh, wrongly, there's a black cross on this uh, dot. And you can see that uh, the bulk of those points are classified correctly. And the network only has trouble very close to the border. So only uh, some edge cases are classified incorrectly. And this is um, shown again in the, the accuracy. So we achieve uh, nearly 96% uh, accuracy, um, which is uh, far above what a linear classifier would achieve. So it's 60, 65%. Um, this shows that uh, Backflow is working in our setup with our algorithm, exact algorithm. Um, now, I promised you MNIST uh, results. Here are MNIST results. We can see again that the network trains uh, well over time, over the epochs, and that we uh, produce a result uh, above 97%, uh, which is comparable to what we, uh, what other spiking backcrop field uh, networks of the same size can achieve. Um, now, uh, I talked in the introduction, that was one of the points I was making, uh, that studying robustness is important. This is especially the case uh, when uh, we uh, are looking at hard neuromorphic hardware applicability. Um, but it's also the case when we're describing biology. Um, this is because no uh, substrate is perfect and our algorithms should not be failing because um, the, the, uh, the substrate is not uh, as perfect as, for example, the neural nest simulator. Um, here we studied uh, the robustness of our algorithm with, far, with respect to different um, uh, into distortions of a substrate. And uh, for example, uh, this is for finite weight, finite maximum weight, or finite uh, weight resolution. But there's also noise uh, in the bottom row, studied noise on the on neuron parameters. And those uh, things, they have uh, analogies for both biology and neuromorphic hardware. In the bottom row, you can see uh, results. So these are uh, simulations that incorporate the specific hardware uh, uh, distortion um, and the, the testing uh, quality, test accuracy after training. Um, in the bottom row, you see a noise on the time constants. And if you recall, in my introduction, I uh, or in the derivation, I said that we need for this uh, for this derivation that the 
uh, time constants have exactly a ratio of one. So it's very interesting how this network copes or the algorithm copes with networks where this is not exactly the case. This is why we studied uh, cases where the um, time constants have um, noise on them. So there's a, a the ratio of these individual neurons is not one. And on the left, you see that if we just introduce noise and keep the ratio fixed, the network copes perfectly with this. And on the right, you see if we additionally um, introduce a shift between the two, um, ratio at uh, the two time constants. So the um, ratio of the uh, mean time constants for the individual neurons is not uh, one anymore. And you can still see uh, that the network copes quite well with this. Uh, these disturbances that, these are, that are shown here are relatively high compared to what we see in uh, actual neuromorphic hardware. And uh, to make this point more clear, I will now, uh, now show uh, the actual experiment results on brain skills too. Um, you see here the again simulation uh, emulation results on this uh, brain skills two chip. Uh, we used an in the loop training setup, uh, so we calculate the um, uh, we we use the hardware to produce spike trains and use only those spike trains to compute on a host computer um, the updates for the weights and then write those on the network again and so on and so forth. And um, I earlier stated the uh, limitations of the hardware in terms of uh, neurons that we can use, and uh, not so much here, but especially for the MNIST simulation shortly, uh, emulation shortly, this is uh, what uh, limited our network sizes. Um, you can see on the right again that the classification happens uh, very uh, uh, correctly for most of the uh, points, and only in the borders there's uh, the network has uh, problems. Um, on the top right, you see uh, the simulation result again, and you see that they are very comparable. So the bulk of the points is classified correctly, and only uh, some points on the border are uh, misclassified. For anyone who has been working with analog neuromorphic hardware, and uh, he keeps in mind the input encoding that we used, uh, these are remarkable results because the um, the precision with which this uh, network and this algorithm uh, classifies those results well, is remarkable. Um, the, the, the accuracy here just drops by a few points. So uh, in software, we had about 96%, and here it's 94. Um, these are again the spike times of this uh, of the neur neurons from hardware, and this was uh, these were the plots that you saw on the title slide. Um, yes, and you see again the, the classification time minus the uh, minimum of the label time, uh, label neurons uh, is zero for uh, most of the uh, correct area, so the, the ne ne uh, network classifies correctly most neurons, and um, close to the borders, the spike time of the individual neurons uh, jumps properly. Uh, now to the MNIST classification on the chip. Um, because of the network size, uh, we had to downsample the uh, MNIST uh, input images to 16 by 16 pixels. We still used uh, classified full MNIST, so we uh, effectively just made the task harder for ourselves to make it possible uh, to put it on the hardware. Um, and you see on the right, uh, there, these are just for illustration, the um, voltages that were recorded. And uh, you see that these are for uh, some samples uh, for repeated runs to show the variations. And you see that the uh, membrane traces are different uh, for each run. These are effects of the analog nature of this hardware. And you can see that the, well, the membrane traces uh, have variability, but also in the lowest example, this, this eight pattern, um, also the spike times. Uh, they are um, the, the spike time vary between the different runs. Nonetheless, all those examples are classified correctly. Um, and this is also reflected in the test accuracy. We achieve nearly 96% uh, on this full MS test set. I claimed in the beginning that neuromorphic hardware is fast, but uh, is that so? Well, uh, we run, uh, we actually measured the time, and uh, for this, uh, in this case, we started the time of the measurement before sending images to the chip, and then uh, stop the time after having the classification results available in uh, on the host PC. And uh, with this measurement, uh, we saw, or in this measurement, we saw that all 10,000 uh, MNIST test samples can be classified in less than one second. This means each sample is classified in less than 100 microseconds. All the while, the chip only requires 270 uh, milliwatt. Uh, and this results in an average energy, energy consumption of about 25 microjoule per classification. To put this into perspective, a banana has about uh, 90 kilocalories. 
Uh, this means we can achieve 18 billion classifications per banana. Another um, perspective is that uh, current state-of-the-art GPUs require about uh, um, a power, have a power consumption that is higher by a factor of about 1,000. Um, and uh, I just want to restate, uh, BrainSkills 2 is not a dedicated uh, chip that is well dedicated to, for this uh, research. It's a general research chip, and I wanted to highlight, try to highlight this uh, with the versatile uh, experiments I showed earlier. Uh, and also that uh, the scaling is uh, behaves very nice on this chip. So having more employing more neurons on this chip uh, will not uh, make the uh, networks, the experiments run um, longer. And what is more, on the current chip, uh, the neuron dynamics are not uh, the majority of cause for the power consumption. So even the energy will scale uh, benevolently. Um, and yes, the chips uh, uh, speed up and low energy consumption redoubles the efforts of this specifically designed um, algorithm. To conclude my talk, uh, I showed a uh, framework that allows exact optimization of spike times and accurate uh, credit assignment. Um, uh, I showed uh, an extremely energy efficient and fast endless classification on the brain skills 2 chip, or uh, well, yes, uh, not dedicated hardware. Um, and on this hardware, um, the, it's the, the, the effects, the characteristics of this hardware, so uh, fast speed and low energy consumption, uh, redoubling, redouble the effort of the um, coding and the algorithm. And I uh, provided uh, robustness arg uh, arguments of the algorithm that uh, allow for implementation of a wide range of neuromorphic substrates and applications. Um, I want to thank the Heidelberg Lab, Electronic Visions, and uh, both Burn Labs, Compneur, and Neuro Team A in, in Bern, and especially my collaborators, my co first author, Laura Kriener, my fellow mindful modelers, Andreas Baumbach, Dominic Gold, Akash Kungel, um, and the hardware tamers, uh, Benjamin Kramer and Sebastian Biludel, for the immense software support, Oliver Breitwiese, and my supervisors, Johannes Schemmel, Karl-Heinz Meyer, especially Walter Zen, and even more especially, uh, Mihai Petrovici. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Julian. That was brilliant. I, I, I have to say, I particularly love the banana um, <laughs> analogy. Um, uh, and, and I asked a question, and unfortunately, quite a few people uh, oh, sorry. voted it. So now you, now you have to actually answer it, which is, um, how many classifications of banana do you get for a GPU? Of a GPU? Well, it depends um, uh, on, on how much time you need for the classification. So uh, the, the, the power consumption does not uh, directly, it's, it's the energy consumption that is important. And um, you can read it up somehow in the, the paper for the different setups. Uh, but um, there's also um, like dedicated uh, ANN hardware, for example, I don't know if you, you've heard of Iris, this chip, um, and they classify much larger data sets, but uh, if you assume scaling, then our results are in the same ballpark of, of energy efficiency and, and also speed. Yeah, great. Um, okay, all right, so we've got quite a few questions. Um, so let's start with this first one. Uh, so someone asks, Moritz asks, how does your model deal with jitter in input spike timing? And as an example, when you're using a, a neuromorphic camera, a DVS camera. Um, so um, for for MNIST, we actually uh, trained with noise on the input images uh, to to reach those high class to to, to uh, well oppose um, generalization problems. Uh, we use spike uh, noise on the input spike time. So uh, in this case, it's, it works brilliantly. On the Yin Yang data set, uh, we very shortly tried this. Uh, but um, if you remember the problem of the data set or that, the, what where the uh, complexity of the data set comes from, is that the points can be arbitrarily close together. So uh, if you introduce noise, you um, without switching the class, you make it uh, uh, come to another um, uh, uh, area of a different class. And this obviously destroys uh, how the network can classify this. So there, this is a problem. Uh, in, for general for general answer, this depends on the problem. Cool. OK, and uh, we have uh, Friedman here to ask his question. Yes. Yeah, so I was wondering how easy or it is not. for you to scale your algorithm to multiple layers to make it deep, basically. Is this... Wait, I'm only I not hearing him. Uh, oh, hello, hello. You don't hear you don't hear Friedman. I hear him. I I hear myself. I can hear you though. I can actually not hear him. Sorry. 
Well, the, okay. Dan, can you All relay right. my question, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll relay your question and, and, and kick you off. For some reason, that's not coming through to Julian. Hey, don't but, kick me yeah. off. That's so okay. rude. All right. All right, you can you can just sit there while I quietly quietly while I ask your question. Yeah, so uh, Freedom asks, can can you use this approach also in deep convolutional networks? Um, so deep networks, we we try, so more than one uh, hidden label uh, layer, uh, hidden layer uh, we tried and this uh, works well. We we didn't optimize any hyperparameters on this, but this this works and uh, seems to work. Um, for uh, deep convolutional layers, this is actually very interesting and. Uh, one remark I can make to Friedemann because he yesterday made this uh, well snide remark towards he feels like Bitcoin mining um, when he he's training his uh, circuit creating algorithms. We can actually have um, event based and uh, not representing spikes as zero and as a, a large a long arrays of zeros uh, with some ones in between. Uh, we can actually make this uh, um, event based uh, forward passes passes. Um, and for this, it's more efficient if the number of presynaptic neurons is uh, fewer. So having convolution layers with uh, small filter sizes, so filter sizes that are not on the uh, area of uh, uh, order of 100, uh, this would actually maybe speed up the training. But we haven't tried it. This is one of our big possible to-dos that we can do with this. Cool. OK, so for our next question, we have um, Thomas Nowotny, who I wanted to get up on screen. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Hi. good to see you. Um, yeah, so my, my original question there was, uh, what was the exact architecture uh, in your example? Sometimes you had written down something and it, was, it seemed to be three layers. But related to it also, I wanted to ask um, which of the synapses are actually learning and um, what's the desired time on the middle layer, so to speak, uh, if you have middle layers? Uh, so yes, we always, in those examples I showed you, use uh, three layers. Um, and it's always for the hardware, uh, we feed input spikes to the uh, hidden neurons. Those, the hidden neurons, those are located on the chip, uh, but the input neurons, are, they just well send their spikes um, because that's what the input encoding does. Um, and there is no uh, designated uh, time when the, input, uh, when the hidden neurons should uh, spike. This is something error back propagation does. So uh, we just we we tell well we should, we we put spikes in, uh, we see when what spike comes come out and say, well this is wrong, make it better, and then error backprop does the rest for us. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Great. All right. So the next one is from Emre, and he's asking about what the um, hidden neuron activity, how the hidden neuron activity behaves. Do they also spike only once, as in the output layer? Um, so in the simulation, um, the, the remark between a bit for the event-based thing, uh, this assumes that the neuron spike only once. This makes the coding very much easier. I think this is not a general problem uh, if we employ, for example, what Emirate yesterday said with the uh, reset thing, then we can also look at multiple spike setups. We haven't done this though. Um, and so in the simulations, this is assumed. And on hardware, we can set refractory times, which are on the order of the synaptic or membrane time constants. Well, those, those are the same order. Um, and then this is not a problem for us. So effectively, they only spike once. Cool. OK. Uh, and, uh, and we have uh, Tim here to ask his question. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear me? Uh, yep. Sorry. Yes. All right, my, my question. I, again. Oh, three, no, Julian can't oh. hear you again. This is I don't know what's going on with this. All right. So get much to your fun. No. So then I skip for me. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you. I should buy a Mac after this, and not use Arch after all. Okay. Um, all right. So um, Tim says in on slide fourteen you had the output latency being different, differentiable with respect to the weights and the input latencies, as long as the output latency is actually defined, so the threshold is reached. But what mm -hmm. if it's not reached? Yes. Very good question. Um, so. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's that's a major point. So if we have a, a spike, we can have um, the exact and uh, uh, well optimization without any approximations. But if we don't have spikes, then we have to uh, resolve uh, resolve to um, ad hoc um, measures. And this for us is just uh, we we define as a hyperparameter um, a percentage of neuron that should fire for a pattern. And if this is not reached, then the weights of the neurons that are not uh, active those are increased. Uh, so it's a very, well, um, 
well, ad hoc measure, um, and it yeah just bumps those weights. All right, and, and in practice, how many uh, how many neurons need, but, need yeah, to fire? Yeah, in in practice, sufficient to have to 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 well solve those cases and make uh, sufficient activity. Okay. I, so, so actually, I think Tim was starting to ask about in practice. I don't know if Julian heard it, but he started to oh, answer. Sorry. So, was that was that your was that did that answer your question, Tim? No, I mean, I, j just I'm just curious. In practice, what, what percentage of, of the neurons do fire and do reach their threshold? Ah, uh, so um, so Tim is asking in practice, what percentage of the neurons do actually fire and reach their threshold? Um, I. I, I can't pull in a number of I, I so the the, uh, the point we, that the percentage we set uh, those are published in the paper uh, these these are online okay. results I will take a look no problem tonight um, and this this is the minimum amount and the maximum uh, I sh I can look this up I can get back to him okay, okay. cool sure okay. All right. Um, so, uh, all right. So, um, so Laurel is asking for the same SNN. How does the brain scales wafer compare to other hardware like Noe? Mm, well, this depends on what, what. So we, the exact. So, answering this in, in general without actually modeling is already tricky. Always tricky because um, you can in general put those things there, but if they work, this, 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 this can be a lot of work. It was a lot of work for us. Um, so we, for example, n another uh, system is the brain scale phone system where I did my master thesis on and uh, in a very simple uh, set, data set, this worked there as well. And for, uh, by the way, that those were um, COBA, conductance-based synapses uh, that I used an approximation for, and then this, the network still learned. But uh, I think uh, with regards to uh, energy or speed, I I can't say, unfortunately. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So I think let's just have one last question here. Um, so we've got another one from Moritz. So, how big is the variability of the mismatch you're simulating? And is mismatch just something we need to deal with, or can it be actually computationally advantageous? For what specifically? So which. Uh, um, I th parameter. think this came in early in the talk, so I th I'm trying to remember For when I saw the thing. question first pop up. Probably uh, yes. Um, so he, um, as uh, we, in our time constants here in simulation, are just uh, one. So, um, and on the bottom you see that this is noise in in measures of the average um, time constant. Oh, sorry, I I just uh, had the legend over there. So um, this is uh, for twenty percent. Uh, so for a variation um, that is 20%, uh, we still see, well, basically no trap or even like 40%. On the right, you see that if the mismatch is, uh, yeah, well, 10%, uh, there's no problem. Even 20% uh, is okay. But for larger, uh, well, at least we see a drop in, in accuracy. Okay. All right. I think we're pretty much uh, done for time. So I'm going to end the questions there. Um, but thank you very much for that, uh, Julian. It was uh, a great talk and really, really fascinating. And, and the, the, the speed, uh, so the, the, the power usage is potentially uh, extraordinary, right? Yeah, it's uh, very interesting stuff from that point of view. Okay, great. So that was the last talk um, of, uh, of this workshop. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, please do come along to the discussion. I put the Zoom link in the chat. I'll put that in again in a second. Um, we're having a, a very interesting discussion, I hope, on uh, why spiking. Um, so hopefully that will generate some, some interest and some controversy. And, uh, and I'll see you all there at that uh, later today. Uh, and if not, thank you very much for coming along. And thank you again to, to yes. Julian. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs>